Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, critics voice concern over proposed changes to Phoenix employee pension plans. A new report looks at how to make the Sun Corridor more competitive, and we'll talk about increasing the Phoenix region's global footprint. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Phoenix voters will decide this fall on a measure to reform the city's pension plan for employees. Joining us now is former Phoenix City Councilman Tom Simplot, the co-chair of Phoenix Citizens for Pension Responsibility, a group that opposes those changes. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Ted. Thanks. Uh, this is a measure, again, uh, to reform the employee pension plan. Let's talk about what the measure wants to do and then find out why you're against it. Well, from our standpoint, it's not really reform. It's more like pension elimination because what it really primarily does is shift the pension uh, plan into a defined contribution plan. So uh, that is a complete change from what we have today, which is, of course, a, a pension, uh, defined pension payout that people receive at the end of retirement. So we uh, want to make sure that we educate the voters so that they understand that this actually will be a cost increase to voters and residents, and that it actually decreases the benefits to employees. And at the end of the day, it's going to be wrapped up in litigation for years to come. As far as the cost is concerned, I, I understand that I think most folks expect maybe a bump early, but I think the argument is the bump goes away in time. You say well, no? uh, I would say look at how much time is involved. If it's 20 to 25 years, which is what the city studies have shown, we're talking about more than $400 million costs that city taxpayers have to pick up one way or another. It's either going to come through reduced services or it's going to come through taxes like a food tax in the future. I want to get back to the 401k style plan, but the employee pension plan as it stands, it's underfunded by what, $1.5 billion and only 56% of it is funded. Does it need reforming? Well, the irony is we've already done a lot of reform with the city's pension plan the past few years. Were there abuses with the city pension plan like any of the pension plans across America? I think probably that's true. Did we reform it? Yes, we did. Starting with a year ago, more than a year ago, city voters approved pension reform, saving almost $600 million over the next 25 years. The city council last summer then passed more pension reform, saving another $280 million over the next 25 years. And then just recently, the past few weeks, the current city council approved um, employee contracts, saving more than $60 million over the next 20 years. If we want to talk reform, reform has occurred. They've limited this, the pension spiking that everybody loves to talk about, and they've actually changed the dialogue and the course of, what, of how we compensate our employees. The new plan eliminates pension spiking, this, this reform idea, this initiative? This initiative doesn't do anything about pension spiking. That's already been done, Ted. Right. That's the irony of their message. We've already accomplished the true reform. What theirs does is simply shift it from uh, one sort of pension plan to a 401k sort of plan. The 401k plan, again, what they say that it, this is a more sustainable plan and it's a more fair plan in the long run. Your response? I think you have to look at the numbers. Uh, if you look at the numbers that, it, that the city has produced through an independent consultant, we see that the net increase to the taxpayers will be $400 million. How they're able to argue that they're actually saving money over the next 25 years is they're actually using savings from deferred compensation that is not even a part of this initiative. But you're saying it's a bait and switch. I got you. But you're saying four hundred million dollars, uh, say, uh, cost here uh, initially until the bump, as we mentioned earlier, goes away. What if this does not pass? How much will the city be uh, on the hook for? Is it going to be more than four hundred thousand? Uh, four hundred million? Oh no, we already see those cost savings coming into place, and I'm glad you asked that question. Over the next twenty-five years, we're going to see almost nine hundred million dollars in pension savings because of the reform that has already taken place. And if the initiative does pass, that $400 million, that initiative actually wipes out the savings that have already been, already been passed by the voters. So you're saying without the initiative, this $1.5 billion underfunding, what, eases off, goes away in time? It will eventually ease off because remember what we did a year ago with the voters, we now have two tiers of employees. One tier of employees are those employees who were there before the voters approved the pension reform. They're gradually going to retire over the next 20 years. The new employees from over the past year, they actually pay more into the pension plan and don't have the perks that the old employees used to have. I know the transition costs, what you're talking about here, among the bumps that we're talking about, uh, those who are for this thing, they say there are mechanisms in the initiative to address these transition costs. 
that's the deferred compensation. And that's where people get lost in the weeds. In order to, in order to, to actually pay for that $400 million mm -hmm. transition cost, they're banking on a city council or city manager actually taking away deferred compensation. Well, that's not retirement. Deferred compensation is a part of the employee's compensation package, and that's built into the employee union contracts. And, and again, uh, uh, regarding this new uh, initiative, what they're saying is that the city will see savings with the initiative from day one. Forget the transition costs, the savings will start immediately. You that's say? Just, that's just not true. Read the initiative. I, I ask voters to read the initiative, and that's why we formed this committee, to educate the voters about what this initiative really says and what it's going to mean to their pocketbook as a taxpayer. Is there a chance, though, and again, I'm, I'm speaking now for those who, who filed the uh, initiative, they're saying that the concept of ballooning pension costs, we've seen it now, we're going to see it later, regardless of what reforms have been made, this type of 401k, 401k style plan uh, alleviates that. And I think in response to that, we need to look at what other states and cities have done who have tried to adopt the 401k type of pension plan and have found that it actually has done just the opposite. For example, take a look at Detroit or Alaska. What they have found is that it actually ballooned much more, which brings me back to the reforms that the voters and the city council have already passed. We need to let those actually take effect and we'll see the benefit. Are there more reforms needed? That may be. Uh, in my view, Ted, um, pension uh, reform it may be incremental, it may evolve over time. This isn't the answer. It took us 35 years to get to the point where we needed pension reform because we realized that abuses existed. It may take a while to unwind all of that, but we've made great strides in just two years. Councilman Waring says the most expensive course for the city to take right now is to continue what's being done. Your thoughts? As if he's referring to the reforms that the voters passed and the city council he's has enacted. He's basically saying doing nothing costs the most. No. Doing nothing, it, 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 two different, I guess we're talking about two different things. Stay the course yes. means stay the course that the voters have approved. Stay the course that the, the council has approved. Stay the course with the, the employee contracts. We're going to see more than $893 million in savings over the next 25 years. All right, so you're saying that what he says that's the most expensive course. You're saying not so? That's not so. All right, we'll see what happens. Good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for joining Ted. us. Arizona's Sun Corridor is seen by many as an economic power waiting to happen. ASU's Morrison Institute is out with a new report on how to make the Sun Corridor more globally and nationally competitive. Dan Hunting is the senior policy analyst for the Morrison Institute and one of the report's co-authors. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. The Sun Corridor, now correct me if I'm wrong, Prescott to Nogales or kind of something like that? Kind of something like that. It's, it's uh, you can think of very fluid boundaries. Our, our world, we often think of things in sort of political terms. I'm in Maricopa County, we're in Congressional District 7. Um, we're looking at an economic model here, and economies are not so easily defined as that. So it's basically, it's not necessarily a natural formation, it's a what you got formation right it's, now. It's, 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 it's actually a very natural formation. Interesting. That, that unlike a, a political boundary where, where somebody sits in a room and, and, and decides this is going to be this city council district. The economic things like this grow up on, on their, their own accord of people just, just transacting business. So it is organic then, if you yes, will. Yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. how much of a player in the world, in the United States, 
right now is the Sun Corridor. The Sun Corridor, um, if you look at us as, as an agglomeration of that Phoenix to Tucson and surrounding areas, it, it puts us almost in a top 10 market in, in the United States, as opposed to just Phoenix alone, we're maybe 12 or 13. So it really bumps us up to the point where we're a, a big time player. And how do you become, how do we become a bigger time player? Well, I think part of that is, is by, by leveraging the advantages you have of combining the, the, the two large economies of uh, Phoenix and Tucson, that there's, there's a lot to be gained by, by looking at us as a uh, combined economy. How do you do that? How do you push this regional thinking, this regional branding, if you will? Well, branding is, is definitely a lot of it, that we need to start thinking when, when we're looking to draw businesses here from, from out of state or from, from other places in the world, People aren't looking at Phoenix versus Tucson. If you're a, a German company looking to set up a manufacturing plant here, they don't think about, should I be in Phoenix or Tucson? They think, should I be in LA or should I be in that desert place, mm. a little inland there? So with that in mind, how do you get the cooperation? How do you get this idea of everyone working together? Well, I think it's just gonna take um, a lot of creative thinking on the, the part of our, our leaders, that, that they need to recognize that this is a real thing and it's really there, and to consider what's happening 100 miles up or down the road um, in making those decisions. I know the Sun Corridor's strongest assets were addressed in the report. You mentioned geography as a natural asset. Talk to us about that. Well, one of the things that, that people think when they first hear this concept of, of Phoenix and Tucson as a combined economy is they, they immediately get a sort of nightmare scenario of a sea of red tile roofs stretching down I-10. Well, that will never really happen because of our geography here, that we have a large percentage of the land, about 60% of the land in the Sun Quarter is actually protected in one way or another. It's national forest or tribal lands, uh, BLM lands. So what makes the Sun Corridor unique is we've got this large, dense urban population with these wonderful protected lands nearby. So that's a, a real strong point for us, I think. Okay, another strong point I think that you mentioned in the report, at least it was certainly a, an influence in the report, is demographics, mm -hmm. impact on the Sun Corridor. Yes. Well, there, there's sometimes a... Uh, uh, an image that Arizona is, is an old state that we think of Sun City and, and things like that. We're, we actually have a, a, a nice advantage that, that we have a, a strong young population. We have um, a, a lot of, of young eager workers that are ready to get in and, and do the work that we need to grow this economy. The, the difference, of course, is that, that, that many of them are Hispanic, and we need to, to figure out how to, to educate that population and, and get it to really participate fully in our economy. Okay, those are the Sun Corridor's greatest assets. What are the Sun Corridor's greatest challenges? That's a good question. Um, I'd say our, our, our greatest challenge is to continue in sort of old school thinking and, and, and look at provincially at what's good for, for Tucson, what's good for Mesa, what's good for Phoenix, and not look at, at this as a whole entity. How do you do that? How do you get that mindset changed? That's gonna to be tough. That's gonna to take a lot of um, uh, creative thinking by, by people. They're gonna to need to think outside of the box and sort of reach across the aisle and, and across the, the, the city boundaries there to, to look at a, a larger picture. Major competitors right now for the Sun Corridor. What are we looking at here? Well, you're looking at um, certainly Denver, the Front Range area, um, and Atlanta, places like that. And what happens when we move up to this, this larger stage is we end up competing with those larger players. And that's a, a, an advantage, especially if you look at a place like Tucson. Compare us to the Front Range, the Denver area. Um, the Sun Quarter economy is actually larger than the, the Front Range economy. The Sun Quarter economy is actually larger than the entire states of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and New Mexico combined. I think a lot of people sort of think of us as still this, oh, kind of a big city, but not that big. Mm -hmm. The Sun Quarter economy and the Sun Quarter population is really, really large, and it's the largest in the Intermountain West. Okay, so with that in mind, and I remember hearing about the Sun Corridor years ago, mm -hmm. before the recession, if you will, Right. and uh, it seemed like everyone was talking Prescott to Nogales, or some points uh, close there, and we're going to be a superpower in 10 to 15 to 20 years, something like uh, What happened? 
Well, what happened, obviously, is the, the, the economy crashed. And I think that, that that casting of it as the sun quarter is going to be something that happens in the future, I, I think that was a, a, a miscalculation. My argument has always been the sun quarter exists now, whether we like it or not. It's, it's just a matter of acknowledging the reality of what's really there. So with that in mind, last question. What do we take from this report on the Sun Corridor? What we take from this report is we get together, we act as, as a global player and not just think of ourselves as a local provincial player. And we can do that from this, from this southwest area where really the close, Mexico is the closest international partner? I think Mexico is a, is a, is a key part of this. You know, our, our data tends to sort of stop at the, the Mexican border. But just as the Phoenix economy bleeds over into Mesa and Tucson, the Arizona economy bleeds down into Tucson, and into Mexico. So that's a, a key part of us, our economy, that we need to capitalize on. Well, all right, very interesting stuff. Let's hope we hear more about the Sun Corridor, not uh, that have that big old dark period when we didn't hear too much about it at all. Good report, interesting stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Beside State Route 90, about 12 miles from Mexico, is a monument to Fort Huachuca. Today, a high-tech training facility, but also a key outpost in Arizona history. Founded in 1877 as a temporary camp, Camp Huachuca protected miners, ranchers, and travelers against Apache attack. After Geronimo's surrender in 1886, the fort protected the border, and in 1915 supported General Black Jack Pershing's expedition against Pancho Villa. A statue at the fort celebrates black soldiers who served here first in 1892, then continuously since 1913, when the 10th Cavalry, nicknamed by Indians the Buffalo Soldiers, were sent here. In 1942, the first all-black division was stationed here. Fort Huachuca has a long and distinguished record of support for the people of Arizona. The Global Cities Initiative is a joint project of the Brookings Institution and J.P. Morgan Chase. It's an effort to help strengthen the global competitiveness of metropolitan areas. The initiative recently held a forum in Phoenix. Curtis Reed, Jr., market manager for Arizona Chase, spoke at the event, and he joins us now. It's good to have you here. Good to be here. Give me a better definition of the Global Cities Initiative. The Global Cities Initiative is an initiative, initiative between J.P. Morgan Chase and the Brookings Institute to really have a goal of reaching 100 metro cities and developing a, a program, a strategy around increasing exports within that city um, so that it can vitalize the economy, create jobs. And it's, at this point, we've actually, 21 metros have signed up and then we've, we've actually reached 20 of those 21. Goal, faster job growth and faster job growth now, I would imagine. Absolutely. I think everyone would agree that uh, jobs are an important part of growing our economy and exports have become such a uh, big part of that that it's almost, it's, it's critical that metro areas uh, participate in that. And, and you're talking global exports here for the most part or not? Global, mostly, right. So as we think about global uh, trade, when you think about our partners, obviously, to the south of us, Mexico, north Canada being natural, but also, you know, trade, whether it's in Europe or Asia, uh, really uh, across the globe. Our cities, do you, and obviously the initiative is there for a reason, that there, there can be some improvement. Cities not doing as much, you think, as they could along those lines? Well, if you think about our state at Arizona, um, you know, the backbone has always been construction and it's been somewhat of a boom and bust uh, from that perspective. And so really the goal is, as we look at the economy, uh, to increase the exports. And if you look at really our exports in Arizona, uh, they've declined over the last seven, eight years, uh, roughly 37%, um, while the broader economy has actually improved by 75%. Why is that? What happened there? Well, there was a, you know, I mentioned the real estate, you know, tied to real estate. And so I think that sort of hid a lot of what you would normally see. And so when, when the downturn happened, uh, I think it really exposed. And then there was a heavy reliance on the computer and electronics industry. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and when and that sort of, sort of tailed off, uh, there was a dramatic reduction in total exports. I know the state is uh, awfully dependent on consumption as well. How do you shape the dependence, the Phoenix dependence, on construction, 
on consumption? Well, the, the goal of the initiative is really three things. Um, and we've, we've dedicated $15 million to the Brookings Institute to really uh, help with this, is, is first you need the research and the data. So um, for Phoenix proper, really the goal is let's come in, let's produce the data, let's agree where our weaknesses are, where our strengths are, and then let's convene our public and, and private partners uh, to really come together, share ideas, talk about sort of common themes, and then, like anything else, it's about the execution. So let's have an exchange to talk about those ideas and then build a strategy that we all can agree on and hold ourselves accountable to. Uh, has the execution in other urban areas, municipalities, are they models that Phoenix can look at? Are they models that Phoenix can say, no, we don't want any part of that? What's going on out there? Well, that's the beauty of not being first. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we have seen a number of cities, Chicago, San Diego, uh, Dallas that we, that have actually entered into this and we're able to look at those models and determine what are some of the common themes or things that we can learn uh, as a city uh, either things that they um, uh, didn't do or c can do better. So how can Phoenix basically reposition itself as a center for the global economy, for global exports, the whole nine yards? Well the first key, and we talked a lot about, about this at the initiative, is we really need the business community to buy into this, that there's really benefit to thinking globally and thinking about their business and expanding it globally. And the only way to do this is through education and through sort of you know thoughtful analysis to show if they're able to increase their business through global trade, that will then improve the bottom line, increase revenues, and then the, the benefits for the society as a whole is obviously job creation and so on and so forth. That's interesting you say that, that you got to get the business community to buy into this. I would think the business community would be jumping into this. Is, why would they not buy into well, it? Well, I think like anything else, I think, you know, what you don't know, perhaps um, you don't know. And mm -hmm. so I think um, a lot of the comments we heard from some of the people at the Global Cities Initiatives is they want more education around this. They want a better understanding. So it's not as simple to say, I want to do business in China. Well, how do you do it? Right. Um, and we're fortunate at J.P. Morgan Chase that we work with our clients constantly in advising them uh, in terms of you know reaching uh, other countries or doing business in other countries. And really the, the initiative here is about education, teaching sort of what are some of the things out there, the tools, the resources that, that uh, the business community can tap into, and then feel more confident that they can uh, enter into a global uh, Competition. We talked about the, you know, the, the, the high-tech uh, bubble, if you will, uh, construction consumption, the challenges facing the Phoenix region. What are the region's strengths? Well, the strengths are that there is a tremendous amount of people that continue to come to Arizona. I'm a perfect example of that. I'm 65 days in Arizona from really? Chicago. Well, yeah, welcome to summer in Arizona. <laughs> Thank Have you. a good time. Thank you. But, but the reality is you've got a tremendous draw. And that is what is needed, actually, to continue to be competitive, is you want people coming to your state. The key is, how do we then get, you know, use those, those, those uh, resources appropriately? We need to have pr uh, jobs. We need to make sure that people want to stay here, that it's a, uh, an area that they want to raise their children and continue to be prosperous. Response from the event, from the initiative, what, what are you hearing so far? E excellent. Everyone that, uh, that I've spoken to or have come up to me, uh, the feedback has been tremendous. But I think uh, there's a little bit of cautious, opti uh, cautious optimism. I mean, I think like uh, a number of different initiatives, it really comes down to the execution. Yes. So I think we have a great framework, but the key will be how will we, what will our strategy be, and then how will we execute? Is, this, is the equation, though, a little different? It's a little moving the goalposts a little bit here in this area because we attract so many people, because we had such a construction dependence. Can you look much at an Atlanta or a Chicago or a San Diego, is there that much to compare to? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, look, clearly there's a, a number of positives here that I, I talked about, which is, a, sure. you know, a number of people coming here. But I think we can look at those cities and, under, and look at how are they currently partnering um, with other countries or thinking about global trade or what are some things that they've done historically to attract businesses to their states and their cities. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from those cities. And I think it's important that we, um, and, and initiatives like, like the Global Cities Initiatives, actually that's the benefit because we can bring 
sort of that uh, background and insight uh, to Phoenix. All right. Good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, we will talk about new rules for power plant emissions. And we'll hear about efforts to keep hungry people fed during the summer. That's tomorrow evening, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.